right, there we go. Recording has been started. <clears throat> we'll give folks a few more minutes to roll in here and go ahead and get started. Maybe we're going to have a light crowd tonight. We get to have a lot of strategy talk or something after we get through our recruiting and training spiel. Yeah, I haven't watched, I've seen some of the Chief Delphi, it's kind of what we learned from week zero type posts, but I haven't gotten to watch any videos yet. I might do that later tonight. Ian's on the call. Ian, I saw your YouTube video of your jumping robot. Or is that, yeah, it that didn't idea? jump as much as we thought it was oh. going to, which is like good from the robot not breaking perspective, but kind of sad from the less cool robot perspective. <laughs> I saw another jumping robot video tonight too. I can't remember what team it was. It was a team in Michigan, I think. They sent it right off the uh, charging station. You want to post that video, Ian? I'd like to check it out. Um, yeah, I'll just post a link to the Open Alliance blog post we have for it because that's out know where it is on my computer right now. Um, so for those of you who just hopped in here, we're, we'll give it a few more minutes, see if we can get some more people signed up. And then our, our topic for tonight is training and recruiting new students and mentors. And then if anyone has a video of their shop that they want to share, uh, we'll do shop tour videos. And I suspect both of those two things might go sh a little short tonight. So I think it'd be great to wrap up with what we learned from week zero competitions. If you competed or if you'd watched some, um, I think we'll, we'll probably end up filling up some time with that at the end of the meeting tonight. <clears throat> Well, while we're waiting, can I ask Nightcrawler a quick question? Sure. So we were at a week zero event today, and as we've been running our swerve drive, how did you guys deal with brownouts with your batteries on swerve drive? I don't know that we've ever had brownouts on our swerve drive. I don't think it's been an issue. We had the dead wheel issue, but I don't think brownouts were a problem. Because we, we experienced it quite often today with our batteries that we were having rapid drains of batteries with our swerve. Because this is the first time that we've really had it where we've been running swerve for quite a while with other motors on our batteries. And it seemed like they were draining quite quickly. They do. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'll agree with that. The swerve does chew up a lot of juice. Um and we we do find in our testing that we have to switch batteries quite a bit. Are you experiencing like crazy wheel chatter when you get yeah. low on battery? Yeah, yeah, we we see that too. We get really crazy wheel chatter when the battery gets low, and we just stop and swap the battery. Well, like the, with within a match. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't think we've ever seen that happen. Are you? What motors are you running? We're running Neos. We're running Neos this year too. We ran Falcons last year, but. Man, if we if we start going through a whole battery with Neos that quick, that's going to be surprising. How old are the batteries? Um, I would say they're about half and half new this year and old batteries. So, so both of those things could be the root cause. The newer batteries, especially from MK, um, they're coming in at like twelve, like low twelve point something pounds. Historically, they've been closer to 13 pounds. There's a theory that MK is, you know, shorting us on the the amp hours for the batteries. And obviously for old batteries, they might be worn out. I think that's a, a much more likely culprit than anything to do with the actual swerve drive or the Neo motors. Yeah, 
That's a really good um, piece of information, David. I think we're going to have to. We've never run for two and a half minutes because we're doing a test. Okay, that worked. Go back to the start and try this again. We're doing mostly auto at this point. So I think tomorrow we should probably run for two and a half minutes and see what our battery looks like at the end of that two and a half minutes. That's great advice or at least something to look at. We're running Swerve 2 and we had our week zero yesterday. And <clears throat> we experienced that one time, but that was a battery that I knew it was labeled practice only. We have one of those uh, battery analyzers from Andy Mark, the, the nice ones. Um, so we have all of ours labeled with the amp hours that they have in them. And that one that was kind of sketchy didn't make it through a match. Um, so the good batteries that all tested good did fine. But, uh, yeah, you have to be a good battery on that one. Is anybody yeah, we're running uh, Max Swerve, and we haven't had any issues with batteries. John, I was going to ask a kind of a related question. Uh, if anybody else is running Max Swerve, have you torn through a ton of wheels already? No, we, we have uh, started to delaminate one of the wheels that we okay. noticed. I, I haven't looked at what damage we did yesterday. Okay. Um, at the Week Zero event in Wilmer, we ran... I think it was like 17 matches and we went through, I think we've got four wheels left. We had 14. So we went through 10 wheels in roughly. Oh boy. So, and we've got the, uh, the rotation limit that Rev recommends. We're doing that. Um, obviously we're driving aggressively, but, but we're at the point where I'm going to go by 30 wheels and we're going to be changing them all four of them every three matches. So if anybody else is doing max swerve, uh, good luck. Are you? you we, ha a... we haven't had seen that level of wear. Okay, maybe we're doing something Guaranteed. dumb. Yeah, Why that's the one a... where we we had a problem with that started to separate. Um, there were some <clears throat> other mechanical issues initially with it that caused it to drag when we first started working with it. Okay. Why do you have a slew rate limiter on your joystick inputs? Yeah. Yep, we do. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, we actually are more aggressive with that than Rev even recommends. Huh. Wow. Yeah, that's something else. I texted Greg Nadell about it, and I was like, hey, this doesn't seem normal. Um, and he said just to keep an eye on it and to keep him in the loop. Interesting. And you're not really heavy, it doesn't look like, either. No, we're 103 pounds. Weird. Yeah, I don't know. Just a note. If anyone else is running Max Swerve, maybe something to keep an eye on. All right. Well, um, let's get started with our regular topics, and then I think it'd be great to go back to week zero. I'm really looking forward to hearing what people have to say about that. But our topic for tonight uh, was set up to be for how do we recruit and train new students and new mentors. I know that some of the mentors had questions about how you recruit mentors. Um, does anyone have a sort of a formal training program that they run their students and or mentors through that they want to talk about? No one? This is going to be a real short topic. <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I can start out with Nightcrawler. Um, Nightcrawler, we, the only sort of formalized training that we have put together is for our, our programmers. And I'm trying to find the link right now on our website, but um, we put together a info to, info to Java or intro to Java type training. And we kind of modified a little bit every year but um, it's very similar year to year. And I will paste a link to it because it's on a public GitHub repo. So here we go. So the way that our programmer training works is that we tell kids to go out and um, go through the first, I don't even remember what it is, five or six lessons on Codecademy, which just teaches variables and if statements and the very simple basics of programming. Um, we don't send them through the full Java tutorial because it gets into things that we don't need to know for programming. And so 
once they get the basics down, um, then we move off into customized training that we did that doesn't teach them robot Java programming for WPI lib, but it teaches them the constructs that we want them to learn. So classes, methods, variables, constants, enums, if statements. Um, we build a text adventure game in, in there as part as one of your final lessons. And we use that text adventure game because you're sort of working your way through a dungeon. And that not only ha implies that you have lots of variables you have to keep track of and lots of if statements you have to evaluate for moving north, moving, moving west and south and east. Um, but it also teaches the concept of a state machine. So if you have a mechanism that the first thing you have to do is open this, then push this out, then start the wheels, then retract. And at any point in time, if you if the if the driver takes his or her finger off the trigger and you have to undo all that stuff, you have to know where are where am I in that process? And I can't retract the piston until I've moved this thing out of the way first type of deal. So if you have a complicated mechanism, understanding sort of that state machine logic, um, a, a text adventure game is the perfect analog to that as well. So we send all of our students to that in the fall and um, all of our programming students uh, go through that in the fall. And our build students are, are welcome to go through it as well. We give uh, students, we have a point system and our point system um, lets you either travel to competition and letter at the end of the year for different points. It's how we basically eliminate the concept of attendance or hours put into the program and instead tie it to what you got accomplished. And so if you get through certain lessons, you can earn a point and um, even our build students can go through the programming if they want to earn points through programming. Uh, on the build side, we are more hands on type of thing and we have a less structured program. This year we did turtle test or uh, the test, which was formerly turtle trials. And um, that was really, really good for our build students. I think a, a lot of we've gotten I've gotten a lot of informally great positive feedback on using turtle test as a way to get our new students into the program and get them building a real robot and learning how to optimize what has to get done, overestimating um, what can be accomplished, um, needing to redo things several times and, and how do you deal with that. So that seemed to work really well for getting our new student, our new build students in. And we most recently started doing something with our CAD uh, we're really trying to push hard on getting more and more students into CAD. And so this year we're giving out points for replicating the CAD for the robot that we built. And so we're saying if you if you code the chassis and the bumpers, you get a point. If you code the lifting mechanism, you get a point. If you get the grabbing mechanism coded, uh, CADed, you get a point. And so we don't have a formal training structure for CAD right now, um, but I think that'll come in the future. All right, so that's my color. Anyone else want to share their training? I guess I designed my team's code training this year because in the past we've only had like one or two members and it's usually just been like, go look at some documentation, figure it out yourself because we don't really have many coding mentors either um, who know FRC code. We got a coding mentor this year, um, but we haven't historically had one. So it's been kind of like a, do it yourself kind of thing but this year we had eight members on our code team at the beginning of the year um so i was like and i've been wanting to do a training program so the way i kind of did it was i decided to almost run it as a way of teaching code fundamentals at the same time as frc fundamentals and this was all and i think what helped a lot was you know i think anyone who does the test can't stop talking about it when talking about training um but uh, we also participated in the test this year so we ha structured that so like we started like you know here's how you code a drive base here's how you do a subsystem here's how you do a command here's how you do a robot container um and we did that with the context of the test which i think really helped motivate students because instead of being like i'm recoding this you know drive base practice drive base that already has code for what's even the point right which is kind of what it's felt like in the past it almost became instead like i'm coding for um 
you know, a competition, which, you know, my code's going to run on the robot. And I think that encouraged people to, you know, start learning things outside. Like I had, there's one new student who was interested in doing PID control. So they learned how to do PID control, you know, in their third month of being on code team. Um, and it was, you know, I think it was really helpful. And it was almost in a way where for tests, we only had new students code um, the robot. So it was, a bu and then all the older returning students would teach the new students is like, what there's two returning students on code team, um, but uh, to teach and almost reinforce our own learning to help those new students, which I thought it was, even though it was almost a little more unstructured, it helped us a lot. Great to hear, Ian, and I'm super impressed that you had new programmers coding your test robot. We did not. Um, we probably will next year, but with our first year, we had returning students coding our test robot. Yeah, the goal I made for myself was, and for the other um, returning program, was that we didn't touch any code on our test robot or the final robot. We got really close on the final robot. Things kind of fell through once autonomous, and the more complicated things came into play. We had Oh, do we lose Ian? Maybe I'm frozen. guess also learning in a way 
but the students who are learning were then teaching the students who fell behind because that not only made it so they had things to do, but then also it reinforced the learning of, um, because we had like, I think two coders who got pretty far ahead this year during test. And so it almost helped them reinforce their own learning by helping out the other students who might not have been showing up every single day. good strategy. We had developed a Google Classroom some a few years ago that actually one of our, meant, our programmers developed and we kind of looked over just to give them a basic and had the students go through that and then put them on with our coders as a uh, kind of a mentor while they're coding, which took somebody who's had a year or two of coding and then if they have to explain their ideas, they got to understand them a little better. Um, this year, this year we're still kind of looking for the student who's going to step in and become the trainee. Um, we didn't have a lot of new recruits until later. I've got a couple that looks like they want to, but they didn't get the training in season that they could have. So, but that worked for a few generations, I guess. Has anyone heard of the Olalu robot from um, it's a Rami robot. Yeah, yeah, we got some of those this year and used them in the preseason. I think we got five of them. The kids enjoyed that. This year we had to put them together, so the programmers spent the first couple weeks putting them together. Now they're together, but they seem to like that. And then you know they can run independently. We got the arm attachment for them too, so only one of the students got far enough that they were trying to kind of run some autonomous to pick something up or drop it into uh, uh, like a container autonomously, but they got to different levels. Some of them got pretty far and some of them basically just got the robot together. So we'll see next year. Maybe we'll improve that a little bit. Yeah, we have a, we have five Ramis as well. One of them motor locked up on us. So now we're down to four until I get a new motor. Um, we actually just bought the board and the motors and we 3D printed our own chassis, basically. Um, but once the programmers get through our intro to Java programming, we have a move on to Rami's. And now I have I have students at NOCAD that need a job because we mostly have everything done in the robot. So now they're CADing. A few of them have decided to start CADing new robot chassis with and then mechanisms to go with it. We try to do a like a ping pong ball challenge or something like that. If they get that done, it'll be awesome because then my our programmers will have you know a small chassis that they can to actually build sort of a code to to do a game. So I look forward to that. For those of you who have never heard of the Rami, um, I put a link in the chat, but um, you can run WPI Lib on these robots, so it gives you a chance to run command based programming. Um, with a tiny little robot and at a much more cost effective and space effective thing than having four or five kit parts chassis for kids to use. Can you use Robot Builder with those Romies? We have some too. I just haven't. I think so. well, Robot Builder just spits out Java, right? So I think yep. I think you should be able to use it. You run it through the simulator and somehow the simulator connects to the Rami board. And so you're working through the WPI lib simulator, but it's actually sending independent commands to the Rami to make a drive. Cool. It's pretty neat. I mean, it, the unfortunate part about it is that if you don't have anything other than just the board, because you know, that's all we have, all you can do is teach kids to drive. It's still some good lessons to be done be done there when you're just starting to learn command-based programming but um i'm looking forward to trying to build some mechanism for them and, and put some other small motors or servos or something on them yeah if you're if your cad guys get get some 3d printable mechanisms going i'd be really interested in those files um we do have yeah. some that we can check out to our conference members up here sweet um, yeah, I'm sure we'll get them all posted on our website and put them in. Well, they'll be in on shape, so they'll be public. But yeah, I think once we get going, Totino Grace um, is very close to us 
um, that that's a pizza pies. Uh, I forget their number, um, but they have some Rami's as well, and they they would like to do something with us where we do something, do a little uh, competition things between our programmers. So hopefully we can actually pull that off next year. I don't know what I missed when I had to go to reboot my internet router, but does anyone have anything else they want to share? What about mentors? I know that we this call is usually um, disproportionately mentor heavy compared to how many students we have in the program versus mentors in the program. But do you guys uh, have any thoughts on recruiting mentors or how you get your mentors up to speed? I can say that Nightcrawler does not have a very good program for recruiting or getting mentors up to speed. It's a very ad hoc manner of getting new people roped in. How do you get to stop being a mentor? <laughs> you die. Yeah, that's kind of, yeah, I don't have an answer for that one either. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, for us, all of our mentors, which probably is a little unique, all of our mentors are teachers at our school district. Uh, we have, well, one just retired, uh, but she still mentors. And one's a middle school teacher. And um, two of us are high school teachers. Actually, we do have two alum that have come back and are working with our students too. They're college students right now. But uh, as far as recruitment, We've had a little bit of success in the past by doing some demonstrations at uh, engineering manufacturing type facilities. Uh, and you might get one or two of the people that work there that think it's a neat program and and come in and work with the kids. And we had a gentleman that was with us for a couple of years and then he had other obligations. Um, but we're working on trying to get some more specifically on the programming side with one of our local entities to try to get some professional support there. I know a lot of teams run very few teachers and mostly industry people were just the opposite. Yeah, we we have one teacher on staff that um, has was well, we have one teacher who's part of our mentor group, um, but for a number of years we had no teachers at all. Um, so it's it's been fantastic to have a teacher uh, on the team now. It's opens uh, it removes a lot of barriers. We have, I mentioned about your alumni. So we have a rule in Nightcry the follow that you cannot come back as an alumni mentor unless um, all the students that were on the team when you were on the team have already graduated. So it's basically a, a three year sort of blockade. So you can't come back and tell everyone that was on the team when you were on the team had graduated. We don't want students to come right back and who, particularly those that were captains to come back up and come right back and sort of resume that captain leadership role we want students to see them as an adult as a as someone other than just a fellow student i don't know if anyone else has a similar restriction like that but yeah we that, do too scott that has a that has worked well for us in fact this year in the past two years we've had one four five uh alumni come back that have graduated in the last seven years six seven years have come back now so it's been really great to get the alumni back in fact it's almost been a lifesaver um because some of our longtime um older adult mentors have had to move on for different reasons several of them had kids unfortunately so babies take them away from robotics so that's a way if you have a baby then maybe you can get out of get out of robotics if you have another kid not you, students. Students do not have babies. Just the grown. Oh, I said no. Uh, <laughs> well, then you're stuck. Got to be a mentor forever. I had a few uh, alumni come back just in the past few weeks, and they've been out a few years. And with COVID, there definitely was a maybe a quicker separation um, because. There just was that drop. They were pre-COVID and post-COVID, so 
a little bit of a change there, but yeah, they were lifesavers this, this season, not having to explain the culture of first um, was huge. I don't think we would have had, we would not have had a working robot week zero had they not stepped in and guided our students through that. Yeah, that's great. I, I'm so encouraged to see the alumni come back. It's, it's really, really fun to have them back. I've been with the team long enough now that seeing people come back, I actually know who they are. So it's, I've enjoyed it a lot. We haven't had enough mentors to have the luxury to tell them you can't come back for four years. Um, but there just haven't been that many around. We have one longtime uh, mentor who is a 2016 graduate, but he's been with the team forever. He started in, when the team started in eighth grade and has been there pretty much every year. Um, and uh, it is sometimes a little, still a little bit difficult for the kids to separate from him and see him as an adult, even though he's graduated from high school seven years ago. We did have another one come back this year who graduated four years ago. Uh, he's been very helpful, extremely helpful to the mechanical aspect of our team. Um, we let the other ones come back like for kickoff and things like that. Um, and uh, I, I would like to, I, I like the idea of saying, you know, you can't come back for until everybody else that you uh, served with on the team has, has graduated. Uh, it hasn't been an issue with us because we have had so few come back. Um, if it, I was, I was thinking that we would at least have a one year gap, but, but I think if we did that, we would still have the same issue that you're trying to avoid. But if, but if they came this year for the first time, we have a significant number of mentors. We've been really, really weak in that for a long time. So maybe we could apply something like that. If we continue to have a, um, a lot of mentors. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't feel like it should be a rule for everybody, but I think it works really well for us. We have four students right now that would come back tomorrow. I think if we would let them, um, two of them come to our Saturday builds and they work with the parents to build our week zero field every Saturday. Um, they just, they just don't want to be away, but we'll let them come and help build the field with the parents, but they, they can't come in and work with our students. But I'm looking forward to all of those students coming back because, and I think they will. They're, they've been, they were excellent captains on the team, and I can't wait to have them back once they're, once they're old enough. Does anybody else have any training stuff they want to chat about? We also tonight um, said that if anyone wanted to take videos of their shop, their space, and share that, we could do. Um, Shop videos. I have three short videos I took of the Nightcrawler space. If anyone's interested in seeing those, but I, I think it would be good if we want to wrap up our training talk before we move on to videos. So, going once, going twice. Anybody else struggling with training and want some advice, or have something they think is really good that they haven't shared yet? Nobody. Okay, let's move on to videos. Anybody want to share their shop video? Does anybody have one? I know Jesse posted his shop video a couple of weeks ago, or linked to it. He's got a really long, actually, shop video on YouTube that he shared. Um, I can repost that if you, if anybody wants to see it. Yeah, I think that was a great video. I really enjoyed watching your video. Um, mine's not on YouTube, but I can bring it up here, and then I can share my screen. Let me, I'm going to turn the volume down because it's, it's while our other meeting is going on. Let's see here. So how do I share my screen in Google present my entire screen, the screen, here we go. Can you guys see this? Yes. Okay, so this is our space. Um, we are in what was the old gymnastics gym. Uh, the school district did a bonding referendum and built a, I don't know, five, six, eight thousand square foot gymnastics space um, in a different building in the district. So we have their old space, which is sort of half a basketball court. 
and we share that space. It's used during the daytime with adaptive PD, PE, and then after school, the dance team uses the space, and then we have it after the dance team has it. So we have to put away all of our tools and all of our stuff in this big gym space area, um, and then we can push our field elements up against the outside, but everything's got to get put out of the way um, in order for things to for the other people that share our space to use it. So uh, we basically have folding tables and chairs that we set up all around the gym part floor for all of our students. I think I filmed this on a Wednesday night. So we usually have about 75% of our students there on Wednesdays. Lots of students have conflicts on Wednesdays. And so um, this is what our space looks like on the in the shared space area. And then through these doors here is our shop that used to be um, where gymnastics would put all of their stuff when they're not um, when they weren't competing. So this was basically a dungeon that had three light bulbs in it. So we painted the walls and we bought fluorescent or LED lights and hung LED lights up. And then I found a company that donated pallet racking. Um, so we put in pallet racking and we're able to get a lot of our stuff in the pallet racking, but you can see that at the end of the meeting, when we push everything into our space, there's really not any room to work in there. And then this last video is with things sort of moved out, um, with everything sort of moved out into the, oh, this wall is our museum wall. So any part that was on an old robot that broke or prototype part, it gets hung up on our museum wall. And then this is two of our mentors uh, working with our new CNC down below. We put all of our old, all of the old robots that haven't been taken apart are up on those two shelves. All of our other stuff is on the shelves here. Um, we had some mentors working on cutting polycarb that night. Um, that's our little Amio X8. And we have 3D printer in here. There's our t-shirt cannon robot in the far left battery cart, sander, our tool chest, horizontal bandsaw. We have a drill press in this space as well. So with everything sort of pushed out into the gym, we can put maybe four or five students into this kind of shop type area and they can work without bumping into each other. But for the most part, our space is a, a bigger closet. We used to have a very, very small closet um, where you couldn't walk through it at all when at the end of our meetings and now we have a bigger closet that we can actually leave some stuff out on the tables in here if we need to at the end of our meetings but that's our space um happy to let anyone else who's got anything they want to share share it i could share an old video of our space let's see is that going to show it Nope, that's not showing it. Nope. Try not full screen on that. Yeah. There we go. So this was when we uh, first moved into our space back in 2013, before we actually got all of our equipment into the space. Um, and they've actually recently done uh, some redesign this past summer uh, so that this first entryway is actually a little bit more opened up. Um, so the two walls on the left and right are torn out right now, and it's a nice wide area. So originally this was uh, for a Lego League room. So this is where all of the, the Lego League team met and did all of their building, and now it's nice and open they've got a display in there and some 3d printers we've got shelves up there on the left um like home depot type shelves and this this room here is our shop so that's where all of our tools are uh, and all of that goes we can pull the trailer in if we need to although we often don't uh, we've got these um assembly tables that we share with the engineering class and then the uh, classroom here is uh, a little bit larger than a half practice field, which make, makes it the largest classroom in the school. Uh, all of the desks are on wheels, so that they can be wheeled out into the hall and open that space up for us. Uh, and we can put all of our um, 
field elements in there to do some uh, driver practice. And this conference room is no more because that, that wall where the TV is, is now uh, torn out and to make a really long room there uh, for them. But that's, uh, that's pretty much our shop. I've been to the robot shop. I'm very jealous. It's amazing. I can skip my update part and play mine and talk over it just a little bit if people want to see that. Go right ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I usually, we have a YouTube channel and I post updates weekly on what we're up to and so this is kind of just right at the end of the update. And you guys can see this, right? Yeah. Um, and I'll just kind of talk you through it. I don't know if the audio is going to come through on here or not, but we'll see. No, I don't, we don't hear any audio. At least okay. I don't. All right. Sounds good. I'll, I'll explain as we go. We're, this is just kind of the end of our pit build. So skip ahead here a little bit. So this is an auto shop that uh, I teach automotive classes. I don't teach one this quarter. So I talked the administration to not making me do that. Um, we have a student run business in our school too. So this is kind of our shipping and receiving area. We have a Fusion Pro laser and then a little universal too that we use for some robot stuff. Um, this is the corner of the auto shop. And it's a disaster, but uh, our kind of our robot part storage area with our pits that we just leave set up at the school so the kids kind of get used to working out of the pits so they know where things are and of course our we got the double because we're insane um we're we're replacing these pits these pits right here with that the super pit that if you want to watch the full thing you can go back and find my youtube channel and do that but these things were nice, but they're big and heavy and having little high school kids um, push them around is kind of a rough. Uh, this is one of the classrooms I teach out of during the day. Um, we got some 3D printers in here. I'll skip ahead. That's the nice thing about having a, here's our office for um our department and the robot kids use it a lot they have some little lockers there uh in the corner of the auto shop where they hang up their uniforms and put all their other whatever's uh, it's the nice thing about having a, a teacher on staff is because like i decide if they can take over or not this is my my realm but that's a shot of our powder coating setup kind of a shot of the machine shop we got a couple uh, an emails, drill presses, a couple lathes, a CNC plasma cutter in the back. Um, some some stock there that we're using. This is our, our CNC router that we use a lot for robotics. It's a Velux 5050. Um, we were making some brackets that night, evidently. But pretty crucial once we got, oh yeah, my dog. Uh, upgraded to that thing, it was it was great having parts that actually fit together. Uh, we do a lot of building of our field element stuff for our conference in our wood shop. We have a CAD lab. Um, <clears throat> the computers pop up out of the out of the tables there that we use for class and some robot stuff. And then we have kind of in our our department is kind of at the end of a hall. So we kind of have our wall of fame with student award winners and team logos and such things like that. Every year our, our students vote for members of the team to, to receive awards. And this is kind of an extra thing that people have designed oh, game things over the years and cut them out. And then we have a little lit trophy case. Uh, to display what we've accomplished. So that's the Cast Lake shop, and I'll give the screen back here. 
It's awesome. Well, maybe someday I'll have a big machine shop in our <laughs> space. Do you have much of a tech ed department down in your school? We actually do, but we we try not to ruffle too many feathers by and try to stay out of there. You just got to get one of them on board as a mentor and then just take over. Maybe. I mean, uh, it could happen. Right? <laughs> it's possible. They actually are very busy with other programs in the school. So I think it'd be a hard sell to get them to also do robotics. Oh. Anyone else have any videos they want to share of their space? Um, I don't have videos, but I have a couple of photos that I can sure. hold up that shows like generally the full space. Right ahead. One second. Um, it's asking me to approve Google Chrome to let me share my screen through it. Okay, um, can you see that? Uh, hmm. Not yet. Yeah. Oh, it's going to force me to quit and reopen Chrome okay. to do that. Oh, well. No, maybe next time. Or if you want to come back, that's if you want to quit and come back, that's fine too. But we can wait and do it next time. Does anybody else have anything, anything they want to share? And then uh, if the answer is no, we can move on to week zero con conversations. Anyone else going once, going twice? All right. All right. So I am really eager to hear what everybody's experience was at week zero for those that have already competed. I know several of you already have. Anyone want to share what they observed or strategy things that they learned? Any or observations? We haven't had our week zero is next weekend. So we're we're, we haven't, we don't have any of this experience yet. Tipped cones are not a red herring. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they yeah. still are. There no, are a actually, lot of them week zero, but they still are. No, I, with it, there, there, well, from what, what we saw at our scrimmage today, I mean, there's not a lot of game pieces out in the middle of the field. Um, and from what I watched from out in New Hampshire, there was not a lot out in the middle of the field. But I had to laugh because one match, they started with all four of their cones tipped over. And I immediately thought of Ryan. <laughs> no, that, I, I saw the same thing. And I, also there was one where they, they actually started them upside down, I think, because they wanted them tipped, and I think it was they thought it was funny. Um, but a lot of teams are going to start them sideways because they actually can only pick them up when they're sideways. 5348 was one of those that if they had an upright cone, they would actually try to knock it over before intaking it because they couldn't handle upright cones that effectively. So the teams that designed for it, uh, that'll be interesting. One thing that I'll note is we can only pick up right upright cones and it was extremely difficult in the middle of the field if we didn't get there before the chaos ensued we just had to go to the human player right away so with that in mind we're probably looking at only loading one cone out there and three cubes because we can i mean anybody can intake cubes any orientation so i mean i thought that was a little interesting but I, i've got a lot of stuff I'll, I'd like to say, but I, I'd like to hear from other people first. I thought that it was definitely like a mad scramble for those eight middle cubes. And I think, you know, once we see more multi game piece autonomouses going, it might not be as much, but it almost felt like that would kind of decide how the rest of the match went. Because if your team gets, you know, six out of the eight, cubes or cones or whatever in those starting eight then you have a huge advantage over you know the other team because those are basically cycles where you have to drive half as far 
And so I think that there's definitely going to be almost a race to get those at the starts of matches that we're going to see. Our week zero was mostly like a practice matches, not scheduled practice matches. We were we had intended to do some practice, like official sort of practice matches, but it just didn't work out. With uh, there's there was robots that did not make the field all day. Um, there's a lot of people that just wanted to more test and tweak things and really run a match. But yeah, with with ours, I knew it was going to be the case with ours. But it takes a long time for us to tip back up a, a cone vertically so we can grab it and we can do it but it's probably cost prohibitive for us to do it at this point until we get some a lot of practice doing it or maybe another mechanism that does it better for us but vertical ones were good cubes are cubes were pretty easy for us um working on set points for scoring uh which is hard to do during a week zero i mean that's something that you just got to do in the shop really slowly and methodically but um, I would say, I don't know, maybe uh, Bemidji team, uh, Kirk might have a better grasp on how many teams made it out there. But I would say a lot of a lot of them made it out there at least once. Uh, there's a few that were working most of the day and had other teams working with them. Um, I would say there's probably two or three that didn't make it out. Most of those made it out at least once, yep. um, especially as the day went on. <laughs> and I didn't get to watch, watch a whole bunch of matches because I was in the pits with my – with my team most of the day, but um, didn't see any really crazy autonomouses, you know, some basic score, the cube that you got thing. Uh, there was a couple of balances that I saw autonomously. I'm pretty sure those were just drive for a time or distance. I don't think they had anything really fancy incorporated into them, although I could be wrong. Um, congestion on the field running back and forth didn't seem like as bad as I thought it was going to be, but that's maybe because – Nobody was really dialed in yet. I think once pe- people get dialed in, they there will be a problem there. Um, definitely coordinating the the balance at the end because there's a lot of robots that cannot make it up there. If a robot is presently balancing, uh, they need it to tip to make it up. So you're going to have to have your driver get up there if you're not going up at the same time and then back down to lower it basically for – the other alliance members to get up there. Um, I don't know if any robot can make it up there without it being tipped down in their direction. Um, those are a couple of my takeaways, I guess, at this point. Did anybody have a triple balance at their week zeros? We had we several had doubles. I don't forget a triple. There was a triple at the week zero at Egan. There was one. There were a bunch of them at the official week zero in New Hampshire. Um, I'll share my screen. I, I'm going to be doing a video for Funalysis. I don't know if anyone's heard that before, but uh, it's a video from, I don't know why it's not, let me share here. Oh, there we go. Um, it's a first updates now type video and uh be doing that probably after we hang up here finally figured it out you guys able to see that yep all right so here's the scouting data of the top three robots at the wilmer league zero i thought it was kind of interesting um so like the the top robots were peaking at nine cycles this is auto and teleop they were hitting 90 plus, I mean, everyone was hitting 90 plus percent accuracy. And then like a missed shot would be if a cone fell off the node and didn't go where they wanted it to go. Uh, obviously cones are being scored at a higher rate than cubes just because there are more places to put them. That's pretty much going to be true for everybody that can do both. Um, one big thing I would note. So, I mean, so there's some interesting information, I think. Like ranging from five to nine cycles was the top three there. Uh, I've got one other picture here. At the official week zero, I looked at the finals because it's kind of a unique thing. They they played four finals matches, so I I broke the uh, broke it down in terms of how they got their points. And so they have game piece points, points from links, 
end game points, which are both parking and charging station. It's a little misleading because that's also charging station during autonomous. Uh, so it's all charging station points, including parking penalties. And then I looked at their unpenalized score and final score. If it's highlighted, it means they won that category. If it's not highlighted, it means they either tied or lost that category. And so if you look at the, the final score here, blue won the first one, they tied the second, and red won the last two. If you look at the first one that blue won, they tied in endgame points, uh, and then penalties just set them over. If you look at the one they tied, uh, they blue actually won endgame points. They had a deficit. Um, elsewhere, uh, which is where they lost in penalties. They, they had a deficit, but the interesting thing is final three and final four blue in both of them had two robots up near the end of the match and they were level for 20 points. And then the third robot came up with about, you know, sub 10 seconds left. And each time they went from having 22 points in the bag to uh, down to, 14 points and 10 points. And if you look at the point differential, if that robot, if they lost by eight points and by 10 points, if that robot would have just stayed away, they would have won both of those matches. So my big takeaway there is you have to either tie or win end game points. I think in Duluth, you're going to have to get 42 end game points, which is the maximum. I think you're going to have to do that pretty consistently to win in the playoffs that'll just be a baseline. Everyone will do that. And then, then it'll come down to actual cycling and how, how good are your robots moving game objects? But I don't know. That was kind of some information that I gleaned from the official league zero. It didn't look like they were having any more difficulty than uh, the, the fake fields we're using. It didn't look like there's any kind of gotcha like there was last year with bounce outs. Um, it looks like a pretty straightforward field. If any, I, I quit talking and I, I'd like to hear feedback on that. I also have some videos that I'd be happy to share too. Ryan, they're 42 points. That's a triple climb, a triple yep. balance. Yep. So that's a triple balance and also getting the, uh, the balanced in auto. And the triple balance, the way they did it, or the, the most effective way I saw it done, was two of them, one would go up at 30, one would go up at 20. They would both go off to the sides as far as they could. And then the third robot would come right up the middle. The two on the outside wouldn't move at all. They would just exist there. If, if they needed to, they would tip it down to enable the robot to drive up. But they would basically not move. They'd lock themselves in. And they let the third robot just drive until it was balanced. That seemed to be the most effective. Um, the other thing, too, is I don't think you need a super small frame perimeter in order to be able to fit three robots up there. You just have to either if you have a swerve, you just drive off the side. If you're a tank drive, you probably have to go up a little bit earlier, turn 90, and then also drive off the side to make room. But it seemed pretty reliable, pretty effective from what I could tell. What about any the, thoughts on that? Um, I don't have any thoughts on the balancing. I think you covered it really well. I'm curious, did we see robots tip over, fall off the charging station? I saw three robots at Wilmer that got tipped over. All of them were related to the charging station. I didn't see anybody tip out in the middle of the field. I saw both at Egan. Did you? Was one yeah, of some top-heavy robots that change direction suddenly, they just go over was one of them green machine they were not there oh okay. <laughs> but green it machine, wouldn't surprise me <laughs> green machine likes to tip over it seems i don't know bad luck i guess yeah egan had a lot of robots tipping over like i wasn't watching all the matches but i'd estimate there's probably a robot tipping one every three every four matches um oh. our robot which is you know really low to the ground center of gravity we didn't think it would be tippable um we accidentally tipped it in one of our matches because we were shifting down from the 20 feet a second gear to the low gear and then we changed directions while we were down shifting um so that landed us perfectly on our backs which was was pretty funny but 
also sad for that match. Um, two other notes that, that I had was uh, I have two matches here. I'll play it at double speed just to get through it quicker. Um, this one, I was stupid. I focused on our robot too much, but you can see the other robots playing as well. If that playback isn't, if you guys can't see it because it's too choppy, let me know. But but basically, in this match, there are three robots cycling offensively, and all three of them were highly effective. They were averaging between five and nine uh, cycles per match. They were all doing really well. And in this match, all three of them kind of slowed down. You can see the there's traffic kind of everywhere they go because they're all trying to get to the same locations. This one right here, I mean, all three robots are scoring at the same time. You kind of have to wait for the outside two to get done before you're even able to leave. And then at the feeder station, you can see all three of them are down there right now, just trying to squeeze by each other to get the game objects. At the end of the day, uh, these three robots, you can see how many they're scoring. They ended up getting 17 game objects. Uh, it was the entire top row and then uh, one short on the, the second row and then none on the low row. And then there was a, a double balance as well. So 17 game objects and a, a double balance was like roughly 130 points. But what I would say here, let's see if I go to the end there. What I would say is I'll show you a second match where only two robots are cycling. The third one actually died in the feeder station, but off like off and out of the way. And in the two cycle match, same robots involved, they scored 16 game objects, just one fewer. And they only had two robots cycling instead of three. So let's see if I can get to that crap. I, I just closed it. There we go. So this is a, I'll do the same thing. I'll play it at two times speed just to get through it. But essentially, whoops. Essentially, the, the theory here is that it's definitely a game where uh, two offense and one defense is going to be better than trying to go triple offense. So I, I think the third robot in this game, they score their auto and then they score one at the end, which, I mean, they're not cycling the entire match, but I think your third robot, that's probably a pretty viable option for them uh, is just to score the preload, play defense the whole time, uh, and then score one right before they climb. Hey, Ryan, do you think that part of the need for the 2D one, I'm sorry, two offense, one defense is because of the, there's only two channels into the community and could that be solved by dedicating your slightly slower robot to only handle the middle, um, the middle scoring positions? We, we ran a couple uh, like that. And, and honestly going over the, the charging station is not any slower. If you're able to do it without tipping, I mean, we could just launch over it. It was it was no big deal at all. We just didn't for wear and tear reasons. Um, I don't know that that solves the problem a ton. The bigger choke point is at the uh, feeder station, not at the scoring location. So, I mean, you can maybe partially solve the problem, but I don't think your efficiency is going to be, you know, greatly improved just by cycling over the charging station. Yeah. Yeah, and something, I guess, one of the reasons why I was thinking about the race to get those eight in the center, because I'm thinking maybe we're going to see teams not even attempt to score those, but just get them into their communities where they're safe, like almost hoard them, and then maybe have like one robot scoring those eight that they get in the beginning of the match, or however many of those eight they get while the other two are cycling from the feeder station, which seems to be the much larger choke point i've been calling that uh all the preload not the preload sorry the the eight in the middle that aren't scored i've been calling that the cornucopia for anybody who's seen hunger games uh it, the cornucopia is like the center thing with all of the resources the people that run toward the middle it's a high risk area for getting killed <laughs> um 
But I, I think that's the cornucopia. Everyone's going to rush in there at the beginning of the match. And every alliance that I'm a part of, our defensive robot is just going to go in there and wreak havoc at the beginning of the match. We're just going to crash into them. That'll be objective number one for our defensive robot every single time. Uh, and my theory is if it's not cleared out of there right away, you've either got to get to it between before uh, probably the first three seconds, or you're better off just going to the human player station. I didn't really watch um, any of the week zero events. Um, what um, was the feeder station preference for those robots that went there? Were they going to the double or the single? Uh, at Wilmer, it was robot dependent. 53, yeah, 48. I saw both. Yeah, 5348 almost exclusively went to the single substation. Uh, we went to both. I think the double substation was probably better for us. With the, uh, the human player can adapt the shelf left and right, which we kind of liked. Um, definitely both were in use, and I think definitely you need to use both for an alliance to be able to get in and out of there efficiently. I wonder also is um, from a driver perspective is one, if, let's say your robot is equal at going to either station was one easier to align up with having a depth perception potential issue where you can't see if your robot is big or tall going into the double versus sight, you know, the depth perception trying to align with the single. I don't, I don't know that there was a big difference. I mean, we've got a fair amount of driver practice in, so it might've just, the, the difference might've shrunk due to driver practice. But when we were at Wilmer, they were about the same. I honestly, I think the single substation going from the ground might've been a little bit more uh, efficient for us, but that's only because our PID for our wrist is a lot more accurate than the PID for our 43 inch arm. And so the, the cone intake height was more precise and, uh, we didn't have to worry about adjusting that, you know, a degree or two for the, the higher shelf. But that's again, robot dependent. Having a camera is going to be, if you're going to be picking up off the shelf or even across the field, you need something visually. I, I don't agree with that at all. I think the, the sight lines are really, really, really clean. Like you can see the entire field. There's nothing in your way. Um, if you're, I think if you're looking at a camera, you're, you're, you you got to be practicing to the point where you don't need a camera. You either need to get presets on your robot where you just, it's at a known height. If you're looking at a camera and trying to align that way, it's going to be way less efficient than let either letting your human player align it laterally because they've got about 12 inches where they can move it left and right to align to you or just, you know, getting good at driving in and, and picking it. Ryan, do you have a, you don't, so you don't have a camera at all on your robot? No. Well, we've got the limelight. We actually had it unplugged for this whole event because the the April tags with our current pose estimation would make the robot drive into the stands if we left that on. So we unplugged that, but we've got no camera or anything. So how was scoring then? How, did you only score right in front of your driver's station and maybe one or two to the side? Or Great question. You... Um, I would say we could score like the far side. It was probably one and a half times longer to score on the two two driver stations down if that makes sense so if we were on the left scoring on the right it took about one and a half times longer uh scoring directly in front of us and scoring one driver station over that was all equal you know very fast no problem i would say part of that was probably because we've been practicing really far offset um we never practice in front of us because we just assume that'll be easier anyway but from what i saw from other teams as well i don't think scoring one driver station over will ever be an issue did everybody use the community slots or did anyone use the strategy of not using the community slots to try to force their opponents to get five links instead of four you're, you're talking the cooperation? Yeah, cooperation. Yeah, sorry. There was not enough coordination, I don't think, at this week zero. 
from what I saw there, though, I don't know if this was a, a fairly competitive week zero, but I think it'll be a fairly rare case where three game objects aren't scored in the middle, especially if you talk about it beforehand and you say, hey, put a special focus on that because we're going to do the same. I, I figure more often than not, that'll probably happen naturally. Yeah, for teams that can score on that upper level, I mean, they're going to be scoring there and you'll end up with three across the top. Yeah, I think that just because that's a third of the places that's scoring, and if your robot you're sending to balance also is scoring a game piece in auto, they're probably going to score it somewhere there. And I was talking about this with someone else, but we talked about how it almost felt like more like an anti cooperation bonus where teams aren't going to decide to actively do it. Rather, teams might act, decide to actively not do it. Like, for example, if a team like knows they're going to win and can get five links but thinks their opponents can only get four links, right, they might purposefully avoid the middle. And so that's kind of where I am with that. But I think most matches it's just going to happen by default. We had a ton of matches where uh, like us in 43-58 or 53-48 uh, would do four links and we would be just short on the fifth link. And I think that'll, I think two good robots at a week one event will be getting probably four, probably not five links. And that co-op will be the difference between the ranking points or not. So it'll be really interesting to see how average alliances handle that, if they actively avoid it or I don't think there's going to be that much thought going into it. I think people are just going to do their thing and it'll naturally get filled most of the time, but it will definitely make an impact on whether you get, you can achieve the ranking point or not. So based on what you saw for week for this week's zero competition, how likely do you think it's going to be that we're going to run out of places to score game pieces in finals for week one regional, week five regional? It won't happen in the playoffs. Defense is going to get too bad. Um, it'll happen in a random qual match where you've got three stacked robots against, you know, three robots that struggle. And it probably won't happen week one. I bet it probably doesn't happen until district championship if I'm – that, that would be my prediction. Well, we have Port Hunemna, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, in week one, and I think we could see it there because that has, like, 1678 gray bots, I think, and a couple others. Yeah, if you get, like, a magical alliance pairing in quals, or, you know, I could see it in a practice match where those three load in together just to see what they can do. I could see, I could see them getting close. It won't be a perfect match, though. Because at this point in the season, they're not going to get the four, uh, the four preset ones scored in auto. So it, will, it probably won't be a max score until really late in the year. Uh, what did you, what did you see for autos? Did you see two game element autos? Did you see anything better than two game element autos? Three thousand fifteen. They have a a three piece auto with a balance. Um, the, the two, there were two teams at Wilmer that had two piece autos. Neither of them worked. Uh, the best autos effectively were score one and then balance. And there were probably eight to 10 teams that had something somewhat workable for that, which I thought was a pretty good number that made me happy that I, I want I want to see that become common right because if you don't hit that you're not getting the ranking point right at Egan there seemed to be less more less finished autos than there were more finished I know we were running a preload and then balance auto um but there were some bugs in that so it was really only docking and not engaging um but I know for a week one, we're planning on getting scoring our preload and then hopefully picking up a second game piece because we figured out there was a way to score on our robot without having to turn around, um, which 
would be very helpful in doing that because then you don't need to yeah, worry about turning. Hey, I don't know that I have any other questions about what you guys saw your week zeros. This has been a really great review. Does anyone else have anything that they want to add or questions they want to ask about week zero? We did see how effective a good defensive bot that's mm -hmm. fast can shut down your scoring stations. If they can get back and forth between those two entry points quick enough, they can frustrate some drivers. <laughs> and it doesn't take much to get back and forth between the two of them to shut down getting in and out of there was did anyone resort to going over the charging station to some did that? some did but we noticed that there are a lot of there are some teams that are running swerve that have a hard time getting over it and a lot of teams that are running the white wheels for the kit apart bots have a hard time gaining traction on the polycarp they can get they can start to get up but once they get up if they get hung up a little bit they're done for my guess on that is that teams are trying to be careful with their modules early in the season. Yeah. And, and that, I mean, like I have seen MK four and MK four eyes go over the uh, charging station. No problem. As long as the bumper height is correct. I think when we get into the season, if people are going to try to block the, the flat paths going through, I don't think that's really going to do a whole lot. Uh, teams are going to resort to going over the charging station immediately if they're able to, if they're too top heavy and they can't go over it at full speed, that those are the teams you'll be able to shut down very, very heavily with defense. Um, so that would be a note for teams. If you're currently not able to do that at full speed, uh, it's a, that would be a super high priority for me. We saw something that was kind of weird. Um, maybe one or two of the robots, but they have that, the uh, strip going in for the charging station the where the power goes in to check level and that's on the fms side and that's really narrow um some robots got turned sideways on that some tank drive robots and they they're almost wedged in there when they turn sideways because it's it's only like maybe 40 inches 45 inches yeah it's 60 inches on both sides of the charging station it doesn't look like it, but they're actually the same length, I believe. Yeah, that was my thought too. Is that it's there's six feet on both sides. It it's tight though to get it unstuck it, once you're sideways on there. They, yeah. they they struggled mightily a couple isn't, of them. Isn't that strip only an inch tall or an inch maybe inch and a half tall? It's it's the same cable strip they had last year for <laughs> the the air not the airship whatever it was called. Yeah, if you yeah. just get sideways with a with a tank drive robot though, and you get. You get spun so you're facing the driver station or the wall or not the driver the charging station or the wall it it's hard to back out of it because you're you back up and you hit the wall when you're trying to turn out of it Interesting. or you go forward and you hit the charging station when you're trying to turn out of it might not be a big problem but there was a couple of robots that did that that fought for a while to get out of there wow that that's that's not expect i wouldn't have expected that that's interesting Uh, how about popped cubes? They weren't that bad at Wilmer that I noticed, which I we got all of our cubes back unpopped, which... Yeah, we saw a few at, at Egan, not too many, though. Our team um, accidentally popped at least one um, yesterday. Um, in auto, it was kind of tragic. Uh, there was a leak in our pneumatic system, so the arm didn't deploy at the beginning of auto. So it shot it backwards. This is actually when we learned that we could outtake the opposite direction, but it was set up so that it would have come down first. And so it basically shot the cube behind the robot, and then the robot drove over it. It got caught in one of the wheels and then popped, and then the robot spun during the rest of the autonomous because one of the sides of the wheels was locked up by the cube. It was another pretty funny moment for the robot. 
Inspectors will be looking for sharp edges and pinch points around your intakes to help prevent pop cubes. We didn't see too many at ours. Not too many pop cubes. A lot of people driving over the, the short end of the cone and kind of getting messed up by that. But the tipped cones, if you come up on them on the ramp side. But um, Question related to week zero. Um, are there, I came in late, so I might have missed this. This might have been answered before, but um, is there any way to find uh, recorded uh, videos of week zero? I know we are finalizing our scouting system. Um, we're planning on using it at next week's week zero um, hosted by at, uh, at Irondale, but we'd like to get at least a little bit of training in beforehand if possible. Um, are there any um, recordings of matches that we could watch? Egan's got a their live stream that you can go back and you can watch it. Uh, you just scroll back on YouTube, then you cycle through the matches. Uh, the first inspires Twitch channel. They've also got the the official week zero. Those might be the best ones to do because you can go to the bluealliance.com and there's actual data for how much they they scored. So you could you could probably do that. Yeah, and I think the blue lines has uploaded a few of those videos so you can just click and watch them on YouTube. I know not all of them got uploaded though. In, in a few days, I imagine most of them will probably get populated. Okay. Yeah, thank you. The STEM Alliance uh, on Twitch, I believe, has the four-hour presentation on ours, or the four-hour, or however many hours it was. I couldn't oh, find wait. yours, Jesse. I was trying to watch it, but they, it wasn't archived on Twitch. It, was it maybe archived on their YouTube? Uh, I don't see it on their YouTube yet. I'm looking it up. Wilmer, I don't believe, did any live stream. Nightcrawlers, our, our, our week zero will be live streamed. You'll be able to find it on our YouTube channel, but I don't know if we'll be on the Blue Alliance yet. Oops, there we go. We submitted the event to the Blue Alliance, and once that's on there, I will submit our um, URL our, for the link for the stream. All right, we're approaching the 8.30 mark. Um, any final comments before we wrap things up? Okay. Uh, what do we want to talk about next week? Do we want to spend the whole week talking about our final preps or do we have another topic that we want to chat about i think that next week it'll be well for us it'll be three days before we hop on we send a robot up to duluth uh, we could do reveal videos all night and chat about robots and design decisions if you like i like that idea i think doing reveals would be fun i know i've spent my day today working on our reveal um and then realizing we need a lot more footage for said reveal. Um, and then realizing that I need to get that footage in a few days if I want to submit it to the, if we want to submit it to the first updates now reveal night. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, really? is that, oh, yeah. Is that, is that Tuesday? Is that, when is that? Is that Tuesday? Yeah, the 23rd, I think you have to have it submitted yeah. by. Uh, okay. Well, it depends on how bad the snowstorm is, I think. Right. That's, not not looking forward to this. Yeah, we might miss three days of uh, very important build time if the school is closed. Yeah, it's going to be rough. Yep, very bad. Hmm. Yeah, I'd almost think about bringing the robot home and working in my, my workshop, but I, I don't have enough room to run auto, so that's not going to do me any good. <laughs> that's where Our we're at, too. Off. Our students are off this whole week. Oh, so does that mean you're having meetings all day every day? Yes, we are. <laughs> oh, that would be nice. We're doing an all-day meeting tomorrow. Uh, so even if school day. is canceled, we can still meet. And well, school won't be canceled, so we can still get into the school. And 
Yeah, I suppose it's since it, since there's no cancellation, they can't really cancel activities, can they? Yeah. You got uh, got room for a couple of their teams there, David? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll drive up through the blizzard. Yeah, drive drive on up to Duluth. <laughs> Hey, so if we have that uh, isn't happening while we're at Duluth this year. Always welcome at Castle. We know of yet. <laughs> Come on up. So we can. Uh, I wonder if 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 they will they cancel? Are we out of days in our district, and they will make it uh, remote? Oh yeah, maybe they'll make it remote and not cancel activities. No, they 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 will. I'll have to sneak in. All right, everybody. It sounds good. Let's plan on next week. We'll do reveal videos. We'll, if anyone wants to share design decisions or anything like that, the cat will be sort of out of the bag at that point. So no reason to hold back. All right. Well, everybody, I appreciate the time tonight. It was a good discussion. We uh, feel pretty good about uh, it's okay, the end of the conversation. I, I really appreciate everybody's insights into their week zero learnings and education sharing that with us all right well i guess i'll see you all next week thanks, thanks everybody sir. thanks see you everybody